beautiful day. Uh, we rejoice in your creation and your power and how you have made this earth and this world to work and function. And uh, we look forward to the day that you will make all things right and new. We pray that you encourage our hearts with that thought that you are in control and that you're guiding and that your plan is always at work. We ask that you protect us this morning, our minds from discouragement <clears throat> and our hearts uh, from being downtrodden. Lord, we ask that you lift us up, encourage us by one another's presence, just by being with our church family. We pray that you would encourage us by uh, the reading of your word and understanding it and, and praying and singing together. We pray that you would be uh, pleased with what we do here this morning that as we seek to worship you, that you would guide us, that you'd lead us. And we pray for those that are, uh, we have several traveling this morning, others that can't be here. We ask that you protect and guide our whole church family. Though we are away, we know that you are with each one of us. We ask that you would uh, make your presence known to us this morning and evident in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And do you believe that this morning? I got caught up a little bit just listening. Some, I love sitting and singing with the congregation and and singing with you um, during hymns. And then every now and then there will be a song where I just want to listen. That was one of those this morning. And hearing your voices declare that truth, it's good truth this morning. I'm thankful for it. I want you to take your Bible this morning, if you would, turn to Psalms, and turn to Psalm number 93, if you would, Psalm number 93, and as you find your place there, you can take a look at some upcoming things in your bulletin. As we mentioned last week, the month of March is pretty full with some school events, and so we uh, kind of taper our... Uh, events here at the church because of that during the month of March and so you notice a few things coming up all kind of focused toward that and uh, a busy next few weeks uh, you notice that next week we have a missionary Winston and Ruth Kumar uh, I'm excited I have uh, spoken with him some I've never met him in person uh, but I know some people that I know the church that he comes from I know what he's trying to do going to an area of the world that's actually very difficult to get in and to establish a church, um, but he has that ability. God has given him some unique circumstances, some special gifts. I hope that you'll be here and be a part of it. I'm excited to hear what God's going to be doing in uh, this couple and in their life, and we want to uh, bless them next week. We have a missionary like that, and the mission's emphasis, we take a, a special love offering for them. So uh, if throughout the week you think of it, you can go ahead and even designate now our missionary or this missionary to India, uh, the Kumars. Uh, but we want to love on them and uh, show them God's grace as well as they show us God's burden on their heart and life. And then you notice, not this week, not this midweek service, but the last two midweek services there of March are going to be on Tuesday instead of Wednesday. And so if you come on uh, midweek service to those Wednesday services, make sure you kind of mark that out in your calendar don't come on those Wednesdays themselves. Come the day before. A few reasons for that. The week that we host that ODAX competition, there's a lot that goes on in our buildings, and uh, that has shifted. It used to be only on a Friday. Now it's a Thursday and a Friday. And so to have the buildings ready and staff awake and volunteers willing, we're going to bump our service back one day that week uh, because it starts right away Thursday morning, and that'll just kind of help us get everything prepared uh, and ready for that and then the next week with Easter our school and then others have uh, spring break that week and where it coincides with that so uh, the week of Easter our midweek service will be on Tuesday as well and then I hope that you're planning to join and come uh, be a part of our Easter services to celebrate the resurrection of Christ and uh, a number of things that are coming up these next few weeks I hope you'll plan and be ready to be involved with ODAX you see there are some notes about how you can help there is a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center about bringing some food for the hospitality room. We've always done a very good job with that as a church and bringing by some different dishes. And so there's some things, uh, there's a list there of how you can help with that. I hope you'll take part in that as well. And then uh, by way of announcement, two other things. We've been announcing for a couple weeks. Uh, we're trying to help 
uh, Nathaniel Hickson and his missions trip to Tanzania that's coming up this summer. Uh, they're gathering the funds for that, and then they'll be purchasing tickets and all the things that need to go with that here at the beginning of April. And so throughout the month of March, we're collecting that as a as a missionary love offering, if you would. I think uh, we've mentioned the last few weeks, it's a, it's a special opportunity for him. It can impact a young person's life to go overseas and uh, serve the Lord in that way. And so there's some ways that you can help, especially by praying. But then there's some other ways that you can give uh, support. It gives the amount there that's sort of where the goal that we're uh, trying to help with. You can designate that in the offering or by giving directly. Uh, there's some information at the Welcome Center that you can get and read through. And uh, set that aside and be praying for Nathaniel. He's at college down at Pensacola right now. And then uh, this summer he'll be serving the Lord and uh, headed over to Tanzania. We're excited for him. And then uh, one issue of church business this morning. If I could have Sarah Walker, if you would, stand for us and everyone make funny faces. No, I'm just kidding. You know, Sarah is coming uh, by statement of faith this morning. I was able to talk with her this week. She has a testimony of knowing Christ as her Savior, and we're thankful for that. And she's coming uh, for membership to join our church. If you haven't met her son, Mac, he is a philosopher and a gentleman. A uh, brilliant kid and a first grader, and uh, just fantastic kid. So we're excited. <laughs> yes, yes, we're ex we're excited that Sarah is coming uh, to join our church. And so if you are excited about that as well, let it be known by saying amen. amen. And we're thankful for that. And the Waku say a hearty amen as well. We're thankful for that. You can be seated. And we're glad that she's coming to the membership of our church. If you would, have your Bible this morning, Psalm 93. We've been studying the Psalms. We're going to read it in just a few moments. We're going to have the men uh, sing. And then I've asked uh, Brother Alex Mandlinger, if he would, to read our passage this morning and then to pray just before we study it together. Uh, but thinking about prayer, thinking about who we pray to, this is not a prayer like the other Psalms we've been have been studying, but it speaks about the God that we are praying toward. And so I hope that you'll meditate on it um, plant it in our hearts. So let's ask the Lord to help us with that. Psalm 93. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty, the Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he has girded himself. The world also established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established, established of old, thou art from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of the many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Let's pray. Dear God, we do thank you for the day you've given. We thank you for this church family, for this opportunity to come into this house, to open the word of God freely. And Lord, we thank you for those that have come to attend and worship. We pray for them, Lord that are present, we pray that you would open their hearts today. Prepare them for the words that they're about to hear about your character, who you are. You reigneth on high. Many of them are going through storms. The flood waters are rising. The waves are crashing in their lives. And we lift them up to you, Lord. Put that aside for a few moments and allow them to study and open their hearts and minds. We pray for our sister Mary Martin that's in the hospital, Lord. We just pray for her to be strengthened, if it be your will at all, Lord. We just pray that you'd extend her life and that she would uh, come home. And Lord, we pray for, Mar for uh, her daughter, Kelly. We just comfort her, Lord, please, through this time of trouble. There are many, Lord, that family members are going through cancer. And Lord, we just lift them up to you. There are many themselves that are facing infirmities. 
And Lord, we just pray that you'd give him comfort in this day and allow them to somehow put their own troubles aside to focus on you for who you are. Lord, we lift up our pastor to you. Lord, he's well studied. But Lord, he's like us. He's got cares and concerns, feelings. Lord, we just pray that you'd empty him of all those things in these coming moments. Give him the words to preach that uh, we may be moved to serve you, to draw closer to you. And Lord, we just, uh, we lift you up high. In our storm, may we see that you reign in this world, that you're clothed in majesty and you are our strength. And may, I, may we together praise you and honor you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. There in the Psalms again, number 93, as you have your place there. You know, there have been... Uh, Many people in this world that have been declared as rulers. Isn't that interesting? Studying on Wednesday nights, uh, looking for a leader, that all of our hearts, the natural inclination of the human heart is to be led by something or someone. Uh, there is something in us that naturally bends itself. It, though we may not think that in in our own rebellion and our own independence at times, we want to be able to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, but there is something in us that is created to follow and submit. And throughout history, there have been many people that the world has declared its rulers. Uh, there have been a few of those people that have been declared great rulers. Interestingly enough, most, I think, great rulers are recognized as great rulers after they are no longer rulers, because while they are rulers, no one likes them. But there have been great rulers throughout history. There have been presidents and chancellors, prime ministers, dukes, prince, princesses, queens, kings, generals, dictators, emperors, pharaohs. The list is immense. But if you search just a quick list of the world's greatest rulers, you'll typically find Names throughout history, ancient history. Alexander the Great, who conquered Egypt to India in about a decade, died when he was 33 years old, but conquered much of the known world at that time, spread the Greek culture. Genghis Khan, who ruled the largest contigu contiguous uh, empire in world history. You think about Cyrus and Persia, Julius Caesar in Rome, Ramses in Egypt, Hammurabi and his code of law that he spread across the world at that time. What, what makes a great ruler great? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> um, for us today, I think in our minds and in our hearts, it's do they agree with what we think? <laughs> but what makes a great ruler great? Is it what they accomplish? Is it what they hold and defend? Is it what they gain and apprehend? Is it the type of influence that they possess? Is it how they deal with their oppositions? Is it what they leave behind? And in Psalm 93, we're called to see the greatness of God this morning. That's really what I want to do for just a few minutes is just look at the greatness of God. This is an inspiration, a powerful little small psalm if you would in comparison to much but there is so much that is here that our minds would do well to remember that God is the greatest king and ruler of all in fact there is no power there is no rule outside of his what little influence and rule human rulers may have is delegated, is, steward, is given out to be stewarded by the Lord, that He holds the King's heart in His hand, that He guides and directs every aspect of life. God does not add to His kingdom because it is infinite. God does not defend His kingdom because nothing can rival Him. God has infinite influence. God does not leave anything behind in his wake. He does not leave anything behind in his legacy because his end, his rule has no end. We've been studying some of the Psalms these last few weeks with an emphasis on prayer. And you're going to notice this morning, again, Brother Madlinger just read it. Psalm 93 is not a prayer itself, though it could be declared. We could read it back 
to the Lord for its truth. Itself, it is not a prayer. However, I, I still want to look at it in the context of or perspective of prayer. You see there in your notes, your notes are very similar to the last few weeks in your bulletin. You can fill them in now. You can fill them in a little bit later. It really just asks questions about the psalm, what is portrayed, what is felt, what do we learn about God? And you'll notice that the section of what do we learn about the nature and attributes of God, that's the bigger section this morning, because that is much of what we find in Psalm 93. I want us to think about this thought this morning that we can pray with confidence. And you notice that it's interesting that Psalm 93 is not a prayer. So the message this morning is not, how do we pray with confidence? Let's look at a good prayer to model our prayer after so we can pray with confidence. Because confidence in prayer is not about our prayers. It's not about my nature or my characteristics or my ability. But I can pray with absolute confidence this morning because of the power and might of the Lord. And so Psalm 93 is... Not to draw our attention this morning, though there is a lot of pattern of prayer in Scripture. There's a lot of prayers that we can breathe out and pray back to the Lord from the Psalms and other places in Scripture. But Psalm 93, the focus is, this is who we are praying to. So these last few weeks, we've talked about praying through our fears, praying with hope and with joy. And in the evening, Sunday evenings, we've talked about some very practical aspects of prayer and setting aside some time and physically, working through those things, praying alone, praying together. But this morning, our confidence in prayer is not in the beauty of our words, it's not, but it is in the beauty of our God. It's not in the power of our voice, but the power of our God. It's not in the righteousness of our lives that make our prayer effective, but it is the holiness of Jesus Christ that he has given to us as his children that bring our prayers up before the Lord and make them accepted before him. Prayer, our confidence in prayer, is not about us, so it never has to change. In the weakest moment of your life, you can pray. In the darkest moment of your life, you can pray. In the most sinful moment of your life, you can pray. Not because of you, but because of Him. So Psalm 93 serves as this succinct reminder of who it is that we pray toward. The world has had mighty human kings, but there is a king who is mightier than them all. His reign is eternal. His strength is is immeasurable. This king is above all. He is glorious, powerful, triumphant, truthful, holy. He is the Lord. That is his name. And the psalmist this morning powerfully proclaims and portrays God as this majestic king that rules over his kingdom. And we would do well to see the Lord this morning and to see that we live in his kingdom. God does not change. Do you agree with that? Amen. This morning, God does not change. Therefore, all of his attributes are unchanging. They are all constant and by definition, but they are not always equally obvious or conspicuous to us, are they? We know that God is strong, but we may not always feel like we see it. We know that God is merciful and loving, but we may not feel like we are always experiencing it. We know that God is truthful, but we may sometimes doubt. God's nature does not change, but for us as finite sinners, it's not always obvious. And so Psalm 93 this morning is to serve as a reminder to us to look at God and hopefully be moved to pray with confidence. Here's the thought or the big idea or big picture, I believe, of Psalm 93 is that we that we can apply is that we do not view life in light of <clears throat> excuse me that we do view life in light of who God is and not the other way around. In other words, we do not view God based on what we see, experience and feel. We view God based on what he has told us in his word and then we look at life through him. But sometimes we form our opinion of God or we form what we think God feels about us or, or we, uh, in our minds, we, we uh, think about how God is handling our lives and we form what we think about Him and what He must be like based on our individual circumstance. And so we must this morning learn that God, who God is from God Himself in His Word, and we assess our lives in light of that. You know, there's certain things that make us feel insecure. Do you ever feel insecure, anyone? Do you ever feel out of control? 
uh, in, in the smallest, minute aspects of life, you know, you, different ages, different stages, right? Different times and people, you know, it's, when you're young, you feel out of control because maybe financially there's uh, you just uh, everything's all decisions are made for you is what it feels like i mean can you imagine being i have my kids are nine seven and five and, and sometimes i try to put myself in their place which, which is disturbingly not that difficult you know to to do at times but uh, you know i do that and i say i can't imagine what it is to be five years old it's like get up now walk here now walk over here now hold my hand i don't want to hold your hand well, you're going to hold my hand because we're going to walk through this. Where are we going? I'm not going to tell you. I can't see where we're going. All I can see is adults' backsides, you know, as we're walking through a, a crowd. They have no idea. I mean, to just walk around, what in the world is going on? They have no idea what's going on. There's that stage of life where you feel a little insecure and out of control. But interestingly enough, and I think that as we experience life, we would admit that doesn't necessarily go away. It just changes. What feels out of our control? Um, what makes us feel insecure? What makes us feel uncertain or overwhelmed? And you can pray. You can think about everything around you in this world. It could be your individual life. It could be within your marriage. It could be within your family. It, it, it could be your children. It could be your job, your work. It could be the economy. It could be this world. It could be trying to speak to people that do not know God. And it does not take long in a day to feel out of place and out of control. But we can pray to the Lord in confidence this morning, knowing that He is not any of those things. That He is never insecure, out of control. That He is never uncertain, and that He is never overwhelmed. He is never shocked. He is never shaky. He is never volatile. He is never ready to boil over, though the world around us is and feels that way. And in that moment when the world is volatile, shaky, and ready to boil over, God is in control. So this psalm this morning, as you look there, is about the sovereignty of God. If there's any one attribute, I, I don't think that God necessarily pulls out of Scripture and sets any of His attributes higher or above any of the rest he is a whole being they are all wrapped together so i don't think the, he emphasizes one as more important than the other however i do think that is in our minds as we see god and as we seek to understand him as a being that his sovereignty holds and can hold all of the other attributes it lifts them up it makes them effective for instance we we cherish that God is loving. We want God to be loving. We cherish that God is merciful, that I am glad. Aren't you glad that God is grace-filled? My rebellious heart, I don't deserve a grace-filled God, but He's full of grace, mercy, and love. But if God is not sovereign, what do any of those things matter? Right? If you, if you are uh, in, in trouble, you know, imagine you got Let's imagine that we're all children again, nine, five, and seven, like we were a moment ago, and one person harms the other. You know, there's, there are moments, right, where my kids mistreat each other. Believe it or not, they mistreat each other, or, at time, or let's just say, there are children in this world that mistreat each other. I don't throw my kids under the bus, and a hypothetical parent named James walks to their children and says, you should not treat so-and-so this way. You are going to be punished. And I've had this experience before where one child looks at the other, oh, no, 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 it's okay. It's all right. They didn't mean it. It's not a big deal. And they sort of excuse and they forgive. While I appreciate that, there sometimes has to be a lesson taught or discipline administered because what was done is bad. It's, it's important. It's, they've been warned, whatever it is. So even though... Child one and child two disagree. Child one hurt child two. Child two forgives, is merciful, loving, and grace-filled toward child one. It doesn't ultimately matter because they're not sovereign. They're not in control of that situation. In this moment, dad is. And so it doesn't matter if they're merciful and graceful and love if they don't have control of the situation. Here's what's wonderful about God. He is loving, merciful, truthful, kind, integrity, beauty, all of these attributes of God, and He is sovereign. So nothing can ever challenge or change what He is. And so this morning, let's look at the, 
the greatness of the Lord. Much like Israel, we probably need reminded of this psalm. There's not a whole lot of background about the psalm that's known itself. We don't know really when it was written or who it was written by or the circumstance. I, I think that's part of the, the beauty of that is that it is just unilaterally applicable to everyone that is a believer. We, we do know that historically it is said that this psalm was read uh, the way it is put into Jewish history before the Sabbath at the second temple. There, so at some point, either in the exile or before the exile, as they come back and they rebuild the temple, which there's something also kind of beautiful about that, that this psalm would have been sung by the Israelites when they've come back, when Jerusalem has been destroyed, when they have been judged for their own sin, when the first temple, Solomon's temple and its grandeur has been burned and taken down, and a newer, smaller, less significant one has been built, makeshift in its place, and they stand and they sing that, and they declare the first line of Psalm 93, the Lord reigneth. The Lord is in control. Hey, they're, they're singing it, looking around, not in the splendor of a marble palace, not with gardens and a gleaming, glistening capital of Jerusalem. They are singing it in the ruins of what they physically have had, declaring that God is still in control. And we would do well to learn. It was good truth for their weary hearts, and it's good truth for ours, that though the world around us is in dismay. Over it all is the sovereign rule of God. So look, if you would, at the text, and let's just walk through it for a few minutes this morning. Don't be fooled, though there are five verses. I find eight things in verse number one, and so let's walk through them together. Number one, God reigns. We're going to look at it this way. Kind of, the text kind of breaks down in three parts. The first, verse, first two verses that the Lord reigns, it declares that. But then this second set of verses, verses 3 and 4, that though there is rebellion against God, He is mighty. And then the final thing is that God is trustworthy, that His revelation is true. So God is king, God is mighty, God is trustworthy. Let's look at this first verse, that God is king. We're just going to kind of point out word by word for a moment. First, notice that God reigns exclusively. Notice the first statement, bold, succinct, encompassing, and specific. The Lord reigns. Now notice, most likely in your Bible, the word Lord is in all capital letters. Now, there are different words that are translated as Lord in our English Bible. There's a word Adonai, which means master, or literally like a lordly figure over someone. Elohim is translated God. There's all these different names for God. Well, when it's typically in our scripture, when it's in all capitals, it is the word Yahweh, which is not a title for God. It is like, like you would think of president, commander in chief, you know, whoever it is, that is the title. And then you have a specific personal name. Lord is Yahweh. That is God's covenant name that he gave to Israel. And so when it starts, it begins in verse number one. It doesn't just mean a God reign. That there is something out there reigning. No, it means this God, the God who has revealed himself specifically in Scripture. That it is not about your truth or my truth, but that it is about his truth. This one true God reigns. The Lord, this one Yahweh. You can even, some, some of your Bibles may even have Yahweh. Some Bibles print it that way. They put the actual personal name. Yahweh reigns. Why is this significant? Because it's specific and it's exclusive. It does not say that men reign or governments reign or that Satan reigns, circumstances reign. There's no such thing as luck or karma. There is God. He is in control. Nothing else. It doesn't say that the Lord reigns and so-and-so or something reigns, Satan, people, opposition, only the Lord. Washington doesn't reign. Moscow doesn't reign. Iran, China, you name the government structure, sanctioned or unsanctioned, who is really in charge? God reigns over all. We have, maybe you've heard, there's some elections coming up in the next year, and it's who's going to be in control? Who's going to have power? Scripture answers here, regardless of who is in a position, God is in power. God may allow secondary momentary rules on this earth, but there's nothing outside of his purview. 
The Lord reigns, notice, exclusively. Then the Lord reigns continuously. Notice the phrase, the Lord reigneth. He reigns. It's a present tense. So when is it that he reigns? Whenever you read this, he's reigning. <laughs> Whenever it is not read, he is reigning. It doesn't say he did reign in, in the old times, in the Old Testament. It doesn't say he will reign in a different way one day. It says he reigns. It is constant. It is continuous. He reigns in the good days and in the bad days, in ease and in difficulty, in clarity and in confusion, in disaster and in delight, in promotion or in problem, in adversity or prosperity, during your gloom or during your glory, during life and in the moment of your death. God reigns this morning. He has never even for a moment. And, and think about this. This is why we can pray to him. You pray because in the ex exclusivity of God's reign, because there's no one else to pray to. You pray in the constant, continuous moment of his reign because there is never, think of this, you can trust God, there has never been a moment of your life that he has relinquished control to anyone or anything else. It may not feel like that, but God has never trusted anyone else with the events of or moments of your life. He reigns continuously. He reigns actively. Notice it says the Lord reigns. He's not an observer. He's, he's, the king. he's not the king of England. No disrespect to the king of England. He's not a figurehead that has been titled a king and someone else does all the ruling and work. He reigns. He did not set the world into motion and then leave it to be. He did not wind up the clock and then let it spin. It, the, the Lord did not give creation like Frankenstein where he put everything in place and, poof, you know, he popped life into it and then stood back and watched the monster live. It may feel like that at times, doesn't it? I mean, let's be honest. There's times where it feels like creation is this monster that is out of control and we watch it in the sin and the way that sin affects our lives and the world around us and the destruction and the devastation that sin has. But do not mistake, as Second Peter warns us, do not mistake God's mercy, His patience, and His long-suffering with this world, allowing people to come to Him repentance for His absence. Second Peter tells us that God is waiting and waiting and waiting because every moment that He waits, Yes, bad things may happen. Yes, sin can ruin a life. But also, every moment he waits, someone can come to him in repentance. And a soul will be added to the glory of eternity, to that place and to that way and to that kingdom in which we will serve and love and be satisfied in the Lord together. Do not mistake God's mercy in this moment for his absence, that he's taken his hands off because he reigns actively and so you can pray to him ephesians 1 verse 11 said in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will god is guiding pray to him because there's no one else to pray to pray to him because he has never relinquished control of your life pray to him because he is over all he is active in your life the lord reigns actively the lord reigns boundlessly notice in verse number one the lord reigns end of statement <laughs> it's not you know in today's world president of france president of the united states of america the leader the prime minister of england canada you're the ceo of such and such a company you're the boss of this business whatever it may be have you ever noticed that with every human being that's ever had authority or influence or power in this world it comes with its own bounds by their very title and very nature there is no one who has just ever just been declared king everything it's never happened right think about our, our lives you are the fill in the blank of whatever you have bounds you have limitations when it declares that god is ruling it sets no bounds it sets no limitations. God is not limited by our minds or by our bodies. He is not limited by our circumstances, by nations, by nature, by our hearts, by good, by evil. Every square inch of this world, 
Sproul said there are no maverick molecules in this universe. Proverbs tells us the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. It tells us that the lot or the, the random draw is in his control. The tiniest sparrow and the hairs of your head, he reigns over them all. So, men, you can trust whatever's left. He reigns over every inch of your life. There's nothing. And so how, so how does that help me pray? Because there is nothing you will pray for that is not under his watchful care and concern. The Lord reigns boundlessly. The Lord reigns majestically. You see it in verse number one. He is clothed with majesty. Everything about this, unlike the kings of the earth, it, it doesn't say that he puts on majestic clothing. It just says he is clothed with majesty, which is beauty, splendor, magnificence, excellence. He is glorious. He does not have to cover his imperfections because ultimately, not to be too specific here, but just think about it for a moment. What makes a king look kingly? It's what they have to put on. It's what they have to wear. It's what they have to put on their head. It's, it's how tightly buttoned up they, have, they get to be, how lavish and soft and vibrant and colorful the garment is. It, it, frankly, they're just like every other human being in this world. To look kingly, they have to robe themselves in something that is majestic looking. God doesn't have to do that. He is majestic. He is beauty and splendor. You take the most powerful man in this world. I don't care who he is. Today, yesterday, past, ancient, living, king, emperor, does not matter. You walk in at three in the morning in the dead of night and they're asleep in bed and you wake them up. You know what you have? You have a dude with bed head. And that's what you have. You take away and you give them the flu, they become like everyone else. They can get dressed up in regal clothing. But it says that God clothes himself in majesty. He has nothing to hide. There are no imperfections. There are no weaknesses. You can pray to this God for big things, outrageous things, beautiful things. You can pray for the salvation of the coldest heart of your children or your family or your friends. You can pray that God would work and give you influence in miraculous ways for his glory and for his will. You can pray for things that may seem absurd. Why? Because he is glorious in splendor. You can pray because the Lord reigns in strength. It says he clothed himself in majesty and says he's also clothed with strength. And then notice this phrase, tied to it wherewith he hath girded himself it's the idea of a of a belt or something that ties it all together but notice it says that the lord takes this strength and clothes himself he is not given strength he has it he does not cover himself with something majestic he is majestic he does not write laws for approval he makes commands he is almighty by its very definition all might belongs to him he has all power. There is no power on this earth beside him. So you can pray in confidence this morning because what he decides can never be overthrown. Right? Let's go back to child illustrations. Child one, ask child two, may I have one of your, may I go get a cookie or whatever it is, dessert, ice cream out of the freezer, out of the pantry, whatever it is. Child one, child two, they can give each other permission all day long. But that can eventually be overruled. Not often, but it's overruled at times, right? Anything you ask the Lord for, when he grants it, cannot be taken away. It's his to give. It is his to declare. So you can pray with confidence because he, has, he reigns in strength. Notice he reigns in stability. He is immutable. Notice the description. The world also is established. So it says, if you wondered whether or not he reigns in the world, because you cannot see him with your eyes, he does. He created the world that it cannot be moved. He established the world that it cannot be changed without his control. He created, the Bible says, with the word of his power. He did, you ever think about this? He did not commandeer the earth from some other being. He did not discover the earth after it had been formed. 
He created the earth and had a master, has a master plan for it. We could not, as humans, destroy the earth if we tried. We aren't going to do anything that leads to the destruction of the earth outside of God's timing and design. He, he will one day, Peter says, burn up the earth and create it anew in his control and in his timing. Does that mean we can be irresponsible and flippant with the world? No, we are stewards of this world that he reigns over. We should follow his direction, his concern for it and for one another. But we should not be so hyper-focused on or worried about oh, if I do this or this. It, it may set off the course of history in a different way and the world then somehow, it'll be all in this. If I make the wrong decision here, then it can, it can happen on a cosmic level that we worry. What, what's going to happen? It can, it can happen on a personal way that we worry. If I do this, it may offset all these things. It may take, almost like we think, it may take me out of God's will and out of God's hand. No, you are always in God's will. Now, that does not mean you're always obedient to God's will. But you are never outside of his control. So you can pray. Because he reigns with stability. He has a master plan. He's the one with all the design. And then the last thing that we find from verse 1, he reigns, or verse 1 and 2, he reigns eternally. Look at verse 2. Of old, from everlasting. Notice it says, thy throne is established of old. There have been no other thrones. Thou art from. Notice it doesn't say you will reign for everlasting. It says you are from everlasting. His, he is not a newly elected leader. His kingdom did not begin with a battle or a victory. He did not wait to be recognized as ruler. He established everything that we see and sense out of himself. He exists outside and apart from his creation. And that is a glorious truth. Everything that we know and understand is within his creation and the limitations that he sets on us Substance, time, matter, life, all of it is within his domain, but he sits outside of it. Because of this, he has never-ending rule. This is the worldview that the Bible wants us to anchor ourselves in, in reality. That the Lord reigns. He reigns exclusively. He reigns actively. He reigns boundlessly. He reigns continuously. He reigns majestically. He reigns in strength. He reigns with stability, and ultimately, He reigns eternally. Now, take for a moment and say, I thought this was a message on prayer. Who else would you ever want to pray to? And why would we not want to pray? <laughs> why would we relinquish that privilege that God has said, you can come to me? Well, what does that matter? You know, somebody, you ever had, you know, the... You go to a hotel, wherever it may be, the concierge, if they have those things anymore, you know, the computer at the front now that you scan in, whatever it may be. And somebody will come and say, if you have anything that you need during your stay, you just let me know. Okay. Like at 4 a.m., let me see if he's there. <laughs> Why didn't he come? Steve told me, what's his name? Steve told me, anything I want, I can come to him. Anything I have need of, I can come to Steve. Where is Steve? Steve went home. I'm Rebecca. I'm now the one that's going to take care. All right, Rebecca, I need this. Uh, I can't do that. Right? Humans have limits. God does not. And when he says, come to me, he means it. I want you to notice very quickly in verses 3 and 4. Even when, because 1 and 2 sound great, right? God reigns over all boundless eternal, omnipotent, immovable, almighty, pray, sure. But what we see, we find in verse 3 and 4. What he's told us, we find in verse 1 and 2, but sometimes what we see in the world around us is in verse 3 and 4. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. Notice it says it threefold. It builds one stacks on top of the next. It says these floods have lifted up. The word lift there, it's the same word used in Genesis that the waters lifted the ark, removed its stability, brought it up from being grounded. And so when it says the floods have lifted up, O Lord. Now, what is this applying to? Is it talking about, is the writer seeing a physical flood? Perhaps, 
The floods were a terrifying thing for the Israelites. Why? Because they did not have the weather app on their phone. As wrong as the weather can sometimes be, it gets it. I mean, if it's going to be like a deluge, a catastrophic 100-year flood of 15 inches in three days, like we're going to know about it. They did not. A, a flood was a terrifying thing because they're living their life. They're going on one day. It banks up a little bit. Ah, it feels a little different. You know, I'm sure back then they had the same issue. Oh, my knee hurts. You know, it's probably going to rain today. And then it doesn't stop. And it doesn't stop. And one wave comes after the next. And then all of a sudden, water's rising. And where there was a wilderness that it was dry, water's now coming in the house. And it's pushing. And it's lifting. It's changing stability. Floods were a terrifying thing. But I don't think that Psalm 93 is only about physical H2O water changing the scope of someone's life. I, I think it's picturesque, if you would, of all that opposes the Lord. Verse 1 and 2 say, Lord, you reign. You are over all. Verse 3 and 4 say, but there is some, something challenging that. And we live in a world that challenges that. Notice the description. The floods are lifting up. It's affecting things. The floods, notice, lift up their voice. It's getting loud. Then it says the floods lift up their waves. There's power and there's impact. Lord, I know you're in control. I know that you're over all. You say that you reign boundlessly, but what I'm seeing, what I am hearing, and what I am feeling opposes what you have told me. But notice what verse 4, it does not spend much time. Did you notice that? That may help our prayer life a little. It's okay to pour out our hearts to the Lord. But notice how much time it spends on those floods. The floods are here. They are loud. They are powerful, Lord. Then poof, it moves on. Verse 4, the Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. He says the Lord's might is greater than what you can hear and what you can feel. And I don't know where you are this morning, but you can pray in confidence today. I think, isn't it interesting that sometimes we do not pray, sometimes when we are overwhelmingly blessed and we don't feel like we have need, sometimes we fail to pray because our needs feel so overwhelming and we feel so Maybe I'm the only one. We feel so out of touch with the Lord. And in reality, it's us that is out of touch with Him, not He that is out of touch with us, but we view it that way, that somehow God is out of touch. He doesn't have His hand on me right now, and I haven't seen Him in this circumstance or situation, so I'm just kind of let be. I know He's in control. I know I believe. I believe what the Bible says, but look around, seriously. What's going on in my life? What's going on in my world? But we can pray with confidence because he has declared, no matter what you feel, no matter what you hear, no matter what you see, I'm in control. The Lord is mightier. And then notice this last thing, that God is trustworthy and caring. The Lord reigns. The Lord has might over anything that rivals it. The throne of God cannot be touched. He cannot be changed. It is always plan A. There is never plan B with the Lord. He is working His will in our lives so we can pray to Him. We can trust Him. Verse 5, Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. What an interesting way to end the passage. God is mighty. God is great. There are things that oppose and challenge that, that, that make us struggle to understand or feel it, but we know that God is mightier than all those things. How do we know that God is mightier than all those things? He does not let us off the hook. Verse 5. Your testimonies. Your decrees. In other words. What you say of yourself. Your commands. Your word is very sure. It is trustworthy. It is confirmed. Holiness becometh. The word becometh used in our scripture throughout to describe like de decorating. That is becometh a, you know, fill in the blank. Looks like, decorates. Holiness decorates thy house. He is distinct. He is separate. He is lifted up. He is righteous. He is perfect. 
He has reigned from all eternity, but he is a God who speaks. He's an author. He has written a book for us and for our learning. He does not simply leave us in this world to figure it out. His testimonies are his word. It is truth itself, the precepts of his word, his doctrines. Think about this. They never require edits. His commands never need amended. His sayings, his truth never needs upgraded or adjusted for improvement. They do not change with the times. They are, in fact, utterly, perfectly continuous because he is the ancient of days. And so though the world changes around us, we can pray because this God, his might is always used for right because he is always just, because he is always trustworthy, he is always faithful, he is always holy, he is always righteous. And he calls you to pray. We, we've talked about prayer the last three weeks, morning and evening. Why would I pray when what I see doesn't always reflect? Prayer is not about us changing God's mind to match my will. It's changing my mind to match His. He has given me His Word. You can say, God is glorious and He's overall. It's all going to wash out in the end. We'll figure it out. Hey, at the end of the day, God's going to rule and reign. He's going to be, it's all going to just, it's all going to be fine. That's not the flippancy with which He wants us to live our lives. He wants us to have confidence. And He has given us something to go to to have that confidence. I wonder sometimes why I don't pray when I'm not in his word. Why are those two things coincide? Because I don't see who he is, and so I don't see the need or the desire to pray. He will never use his might or his power for your harm. So in confidence, you can pray because you can trust him. I want you to turn. We're going to read one passage or one verse and then be done. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Jesus reigns over all. God reigns over all. You don't have to know what's coming next. You don't have to know every detail to pray. You don't even have to know what to pray or how exactly to say it. Because here's what I want you to understand this morning from Hebrews 4 is you do not pray because of who you are as a Christian. We pray because of who God is as our leader, ruler, omnipotent, reigning king. He has reigned, he reigns, and he will reign forever. So let me just encourage you this morning, anchor yourself to that. I don't know where you are. You could be in a great moment of life, joy. Don't mishear a, a passage about prayer and think that it doesn't apply to you because everything's going fine right now. You have decent health. Family's going okay. Everything's held together. Who do you think holds that together? If you have joy, have gratitude to the God who has given it to you. If you have gladness and happiness in the circumstance of your life, have joy in going to the Lord in that satisfaction. If you're struggling, if you sense or see struggle, if you're anxious, in my own heart, even throughout this week, as I'm dealing with things in my own life, continually having to come back, this is not about me. It is about the Lord. Hebrews 4.16. We'll read a couple verses before it. Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like uh, as we are yet without sin. We serve a perfect Savior. What should my response be? Let's sum it all up in one sentence today. You know, it's time change. It's spring. By tomorrow or Tuesday, you're going to have trouble knowing what state you live in and what year it is, right? This is a tough week for a lot of us. It really sets in hard over the next couple of days. So let's just summarize it down to a couple thoughts or a couple things. We pray because God reigns. He is mighty. He rules over all. We pray because our Savior has worked in our lives and made us one of God's children. Notice verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. 
Now, you can read that verse. Sometimes you read that verse, and I think, oh, yeah, yeah, we can come boldly to be saved. But notice, and come for help in time of need. I don't know you. I don't just need help the day of my salvation. I need help every day. I need help in a lot of things, in a lot of ways. And this promise is true to us. He says, God is over all, and Jesus is Lord. So come to him, he has said. Come boldly to him as you need him. And we recognize that we need him always. So pray without ceasing. There's a song, let me encourage you with this as we close. There's a song written, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Stuart Townsend, I believe, is the writer's name. He, he wrote this song. It's called Jesus is Lord. And the last uh, stanza has always stood out to me. It, it's about Jesus being Lord. The verses walk through, and it talks about his birth, his life, his death, his perfection, his resurrection, the life that he gives. But it talks one day about his coming again. And it's a profound statement. Let me encourage you this morning. I don't know where you are as a Christian, a believer, an unbeliever. But the God that we talked about today, He does reign. And if you are unsaved this morning, the only proper response is to submit to Him and say that I have sinned against Him. I have done wrong, and I cannot fix that sin myself. He alone can save. He alone rules and reigns. And I give my heart and life to him. And I declare Jesus is Lord. God reigns. It's the only proper response. You'll never earn your way to him. You'll never figure out a way to him outside of what he has told us. Come, come in mercy and grace. But the last stanza of that song I reference, it says this. Jesus is Lord. A shout of joy. A cry of anguish. You say, what does he mean by that? Here's what the author, author means. When the Lord returns, the whole earth will say, Jesus is Lord. For some, it will be a shout of joy. For some, it will be a cry of anguish. He really is. A cry of terror. And so let me encourage you this morning that a God so brilliant and so magnificent does not just move our hearts to pray. He moves our hearts to share him with others. Because everyone you know will meet the Lord with a shout of joy or a cry of anguish. May we get out of ourselves this week. May we pray to the Lord who can do mighty things. And may we lead others to him. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. We rejoice in it profound truth you are over all above all may we trust you lord may we pray to you as we get ready to sing in just a moment i'm going to pray back the psalm like we did a couple weeks ago and I'm just going to walk our way through it. i'm just going to pray it back to the lord you pray in your own heart with me as it applies to you god you rule over everything you are beautiful you are powerful. Lord, you are consistent and constant. This world is shaky in my, under my feet and in my life. But you, we know it cannot be moved from your hand. Lord, you have been ruling from old, from everlasting, and you will rule eternally. God, that our lives, as Brother Madlinger prayed a few moments ago, there's storms, there's issues, there's things that come up they're difficult. We hear them. We see them. We're impacted by them. But today we pray because you are mightier than them. You are mightier than waves and waters of our lives. We trust that what you told us today in Psalm 93 is true. You are holy. You are Lord forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand if you would. We'll sing a familiar song to us just as I am. And that's all we can come to the Lord. We don't come to the Lord because of who we are. We come to the Lord because of who He is. But sing it today. If the Lord's worked in your heart, you're at the altar there at your seat. May we magnify the Lord together. Let's sing. <clears throat> I come. Amen. We serve a God who is mighty. And though it's easy to forget and be distracted, He is over all. 
So this week, may we rejoice and live that way. May we pray that way. We're going to be back this evening, adults together, one more time tonight on prayer, kind of on a practical sense, walking through that one more time uh, this evening. And in the next few weeks, we have Easter, a few things that are a little different. We'll start our Genesis series in April, some things coming up. I hope that you'll be back this evening. We'll be talking about some things upcoming, kind of a structure of uh, some of our classes and some things that will be coming up. Um, I hope that you'll come and be a, a part of it if you haven't been already. Uh, let's be dismissed.